My name is Guilherme. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And today is all about chops. I think uh, people don't talk about too much. I don't talk too much about chops. Uh, it's handful. It uh, can save a lot of problems. And, uh, well, it opens a lot of possibilities for us. And today, Fabricio will talk, uh, well, the cool part of chops. Uh, he will talk about uh, using music. It's a different approach than Andrew Lauer uh, has been doing. It's very new. I, I've never heard uh, anything about it, at least anything that uh, Fabricio is showing us or will be showing us today. And uh, after that, I will show the boring stuff. Uh, I, I, I'm feeling a pattern here. <laughs> it's the second time that uh, uh, you show the cool stuff and I'm the boring stuff, but that's okay. And I'll show like um, a VFX um, use of constraints. I don't see people talking uh, a lot on, about constraints in chops just uh, in object level. It has a lot of, um, a lot of power that can be used uh, from chops. So that's it, music and constraints. Feel free to ask questions anytime. Just open the, the mic or um, send us text over the chat. And with that said, Fabricio, it's up to you. Yeah, thank you, Guy. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, well, um, let me, a couple of familiar faces uh, already, but let me uh, start in by introducing myself for those who don't know me. So my name is Fabrizio Chamon. I'm a effects 2D kind of uh, artist because I, I tend to, to do a lot of stuff uh, other than effects. So I also like to tinker a lot with Houdini in uh, like different ways. And one of them is music. So today I'm going to show you a little bit of my experiments in here, some cool projects that, uh, as Guilherme said, there's not much people talking about. So I, uh, we, we find that to be like a great opportunity for us to uh, present to you shops in a different way, right? So yeah, uh, feel free to ask anytime, uh, just, uh, unmute your microphones and uh, start asking. Uh, you can just be free to ask. Uh, okay, so let's start by, I'm going to share my screen here. Or basically, uh, so just let me interrupt you. Uh, for a yeah, minute. go ahead. Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions in Portuguese. We'll repeat it in English. So don't, don't mind about that. So Fabrice, sorry. Yeah, so I think uh, I need permission to share the screen. Um, Paola? Paola, can you? I just allowed you. You should be able to share now. Try yes. again. Okay. Thank sure. you very much. I also need to share my audio. There you go. Okay. So, can you all see my screen? Hopefully. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, great. Awesome. So, Chops for Music. Uh, well, uh, Let's start with some possibilities. So right now, Houdini already supports many stuff you can do with audio. Uh, I just don't see people using, I'm not sure why, because it's such an awesome thing. But anyway, uh, you are able to import any raw audio data like WAV or MP3 or any kind of files. Uh, you can mm, animate to beats, to music. Uh, you can extract instruments from audio files using main, uh, many of the nodes. And you can do all sorts of animation with that. You can create all sorts of visualizers like we have in the old, like Winamp days. Uh, I believe you remember those kind of cool visualizations. We can do that. I have examples for that. Uh, we can also import MIDI files. So for MIDI files, uh, well, everybody knows MIDI, but just uh, like a technical information, MIDI files contain all like the notes for music itself. It's like a, like a, a, a score contained inside a file. So if have, you have all access to all like the MIDI channels, the notes, timings, velocities, and stuff. Uh, you can use that to create like 
music sheets that can play in real time. Um, and you can also use notes to trigger simulations. That's a very cool feature uh, you could do. So I have an example here where I, I make uh, like this sort of any music. I don't know if you uh, remember any music. It was like a software uh, company back in the days where they, they did lots of uh, like interesting uh, 3D stuff in sync with music, like uh, robot arms, like playing drums and stuff like that. You can do that in mm -hmm. Houdini. Um, you also can do generative audio. This is a very interesting uh, stuff you can do. Of course, uh, audio is such a complicated thing that you have to know what you're doing to generate like raw wave files. But you can do that. You can generate from, uh, because like chop uh, uh, channels are just like regular channels for uh, audio as, as they are for other types of animations. So you can just create that like procedurally. And you can also uh, export like stereo and 3D spatial audio. This is like a new stuff that I don't see much people like even knowing about the 3D spatial audio. I have examples for that too. And finally proceduralism, which is great. Like it's the heart of Houdini and you can use that for music too. And finally you can export uh, for like the, uh, the, the same formats, Wave MIDI, and you can also, sorry, just went ahead of myself here. And you can ask, also send uh, mid, uh, mid channels, uh, mid, mid signals to an external player. So you can use Houdini to play audio in another uh, audio tool. So with that, let me go into uh, waveform. So this is like raw, raw audio da data. So the first example here is just to show you that um, this is like getting the source from audio you have this very big data inside Houdini with lots of samples and, and information, and which is very different from MIDI in a sense that you don't have access to individual instruments. You have just like this big wave and you have to uh, take care of extracting stuff that you want to animate with. So let's say you want to animate to the kick of a drum, you have to use the internal chop nodes to extract parts of this audio, right? So. Uh, this is like a very uh, short uh, introduction to audio because without this, it's going to be a little bit difficult to understand like all the specific stuff I'm doing. But just for the record's frequency, uh, it's, uh, it measures the amount of information for a specific time window. Um, that is like a, a thing we use a lot in shops. So either for measuring the resolution of a channel, which uh, it's called sample rate, um, and also for audio, for example, for you have the MP3 files that are saved at 44 uh, and 100 kilohertz. So this is the, like the, what they call the CD quality. So this is uh, like the resolution of this file. Uh, and we need all that uh, resolution to also translate to chops. So we translate in the form of the simple rate. So, and we usually, uh, or often we use hertz as a unit measure, okay? And that's what I usually uh, work in Houdini. Uh, so here you can see the, the sample rate. So as any regular channel, you have these little dots here, which denotes like the divisions of your channel. Uh, in this case, I'm using 10 kilohertz or 10,000 hertz. And you can see this is like the um, division of your uh, channels, right? So enough with the boring stuff. Guilherme said uh, he has the boring stuff, but I also do. <laughs> Okay, so let's see uh, like a very simple example on uh, how we can animate to the beats of a sound and extract um, like the kicks and snares. So this is a very simple example. Can you all hear the sound? Great, okay. Uh -huh. So what you see here is just a very, very simple way of extracting the kicks from uh, the snares on a drum set. And uh, you see, I, I'm separating and animating uh, them uh, in different areas, but they all come from the same audio file. So this is an example of what we can do with shops and music. Uh, this one is a kind of a visualizer thing. Um, I'm going to play just for you to see it working. So. <laughs> Ah, 
So something like that. And uh, well, this is like just small tools that I did for testing. Uh, but you can see you can deal with waveforms, like do spectrum visualization. Uh, you can do all sorts of cool stuff. And now let's move on to a more interesting project. So this is uh, the, the Tesla Coil project I created just for this presentation. So I'm, this is all for uh, enough of uh, presentations. Let's go to Houdini. So I'm going to open the file here. Or actually, let me open the animation itself. So this is something that I've been uh, doing to create animations that are synced to the sound and also to experiment with spatial audio. So let me play that for you. Just uh, like a disclaimer here, uh, watch out to your uh, volumes because this can possibly get quite loud, okay? <laughs> so let me open that. The, the video so it you, you can see it doesn't um, like let me try and pause this at some point here so what you have in here is something that animates to the sound so everything you're seeing there is procedure generated uh, and sync it to the sound um, and also it's like a very long shot but it's nice if I I'm sure you can, you couldn't get the like the full experience but when you hear uh, with the um, with your headphones, and probably the streaming is not going to allow for that, but you can hear the sound coming from the left side, uh, and this is because we are using uh, I'm using stereo uh, spatial 3D audio in this um, in this uh, scene, and also these little guys here they dance to the music. There is like this Tesla coil that uh, shoots like lightning bolts, sync it to the music. The audio itself is also synced to the music inside Houdini. So let me uh, drive you through the scene here. So it's possibly not going to play in real time because it's a little bit heavy. But anyway, I've disabled the lightning bolt. And so just to give you an idea here, what we have is this. So we have this camera that uh, like goes through this Tesla coil. Let me mute is a little for a little while so what i've done here to get the audio from this one is by using the 3d uh spatial audio so here we have this sound source which is basically something that you can um use to get position your audio in the 3d space right so just to make things more easy so let me uncheck some of the stuff in here like this, okay. So what you have in here is this audio source positioned at the Tesla coil. And what I can do with that is to, inside the CHOP network, uh, uh, well, let me start uh, from, from the beginnings. So first I have this uh, sound effects that is just a single lightning bolt, right? So it's just one. 
So what I can do in Chops is to make use of uh, this copy node to extract beats from the music and create or duplicate this audio oh, through my timeline. Uh, could yeah. you show us the, the curves in the motion effects view? Yes, sure, of course. Let me open that here. Uh, motion effects. So yeah, basically this is uh, like a very long set of uh, sound effects for lightning bolts. I've just trimmed it to a single one, which is this one, and send that to the first uh, frame. Um, then for the music itself, um, well, just a small thing here, probably it's a very long thing, so I can't go through everything I'm doing here. I'm just giving you some hints, but anyway, so what I'm doing here is getting this audio file, which is a nice sound from Daft Punk, and I'm extracting the beats, right? So at every beat, I'm generating a, a signal, which we can see in this count thing here. So at every beat, I'm generating a signal, and I'm uh, uh, copying this uh, simple lightning bolt to that uh, part, okay? So we can copy here, and it plays uh, at the sync at the music, okay? So now that we have that, uh, this sound that comes out is just uh, like a, a sequence of like lightning bolts to the beat. And we can input that to this sound source here. So this is now uh, working uh, in 3D space. And now what I can do is to create microphones on the camera. So those microphones are attached to the camera. Sorry, there you go. So the microphones are attached to the camera and what I've done is to measure more or less the distance between the ears in a, like a human head and position the microphones uh, in a way that they capture what like a human would do if they were the, like the camera, right? So now the camera goes through the scene and the incredible thing about like 3D spatial audio is that it can capture the audio like uh, bouncing off of your uh, surfaces in 3D. So this is like real world uh, microphones capturing a real world source audio, okay? And so with that, I, I have a new WAV file which I can export from Houdini and that, that has like the stereo quality of having the sound coming from where they are in 3D. So it's actually getting the sound from this 3D source. So each one of the microphones like acquire different volumes and, and like reverberations type of stuff. So this is the nice thing about this uh, shot here. So, sorry, let me go back to this here. Uh, yeah, so this is like the, the cool, stuff about, cool stuff about this scene. And also I have all sorts of uh, other elements here. So we have the guys dancing. So the guys are just uh, using wrangles to query the chop channels. So again, that beat channel, I can query the value at different frames and I uh, make them like pop up at different frames using chops. So, uh, and also we have this sort of visual, visual, uh, visualization here in the back, okay? So this is basically uh, out ahead for, for this uh, shot. Um, you see, it's like kind of a, a relatively simple shot um, in a sense that, can you, can you hear me talking together with the sound? Okay, great. Yeah. So this is a kind of shot that uh, is simple in a sense that it's just a moving camera, but there's so much going on. And this is all part by show and all these incredible features, right? So, do, does anybody have questions or would like to ask anything more specific for, for this one? Great, so, well, uh, yeah, maybe, Guilherme, I don't know if you want to carry on from here or if you want me to talk a little bit more about some, some of the stuff in that scene. Yeah, yeah go or, on, go on on the music stuff, and then I, I will change the topic to constraints. Okay, great. So let's, uh, so I have some examples here in my folder. So some other stuff I've been doing with uh, audio, Again, animating to the beats of the music. Here I have this kind of motion graphics, kind of experiment, really.
you get the idea. So this is like all very very fun to 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 do. And again, everything procedural. Uh, you just have to if you want to change the song, just switch like a knob and you're ready to go. Um, I'm experimenting with integrating this kind of like a procedural generated animation for music with PDG also, which is great. So like uh, I have this one like with a much more longer run, but it starts to get tired <laughs> from seeing the same thing. But uh, all these sort of like smoke uh, things are automatically generating at the like some beats and they are all like generated inside PDG. So it's a nice uh, way to like couple the two things. Um, yeah, so let me check if I have other stuff here. For example, I have uh, this one, which is a much simpler example. Again, just animating to the beats. I have one that uh, is like a small variation of this thing. Yeah, so lots of examples. Um, well, um, I can try and go through some of the nodes in here to explain how to extract uh, the beats. So let me go into the chop network here. So I also open the motion effects view. So I'll go one by one here. So what you see is like the raw waveform imported into chops. Uh, this is stereo, so if you really, really zoom in. You can see we have two curves here, one for the left here and one for the right, right here. And as you can see, audio is very heavy. So we have lots and lots and lots of data here. So it's very important for you to uh, try and always optimize for audio. Um, because although Houdini can, can play audio, uh, if you start doing a lot of stuff, it, you, you need to like cache, it's not, it becomes not real time anymore. So here, what I do is I import um, the audio. Oftentimes, I usually delete one of the channels, so I just keep with one channel. So if you middle click the file, you can see it generates two channels, channel zero and channel one. So those are the stereo uh, waveforms. Then I delete and just keep like one, uh, one ear. Uh, what I can do now is use a, like a set of uh, nodes to extract the beats. For example, we can use one that is called uh, the equalizer, so the parametric equalizer, or you can use the pass filter. So the idea here is that you want to isolate the frequencies, right? So audio have different frequencies. So for example, if, if you have a bass kind of sound, you have lower frequency. If you have like a violin or a, a very high pitch sound, you have high frequencies. So the idea is that you want to isolate frequencies to like get like isolated instruments or just maybe a kick or something. So those nodes will do that. So you can get the, like the frequency range of your audio and just clamp some values. So you have just a, like a small subset of that. And when you have like isolated that frequency, you can create like um, something that uh, you can create with the, sorry, what is the node again? It is the, Envelope, yeah, this one. So the envelope node uh, is able to detect your uh, your uh, hills and valleys, so it can create like uh, like an envelope of your curve. So using the, like the three nodes, first the sum of the uh, filter no, uh, to filter of frequencies, then the envelope node, and finally the count node. So the count node is also a very good one. So the count node will count how many times you go to the uphill or downhill. So with that, you can trigger, use that to trigger um, stuff in your scene. So for example, every time the kick uh, hits in, you can maybe emit some smoke or something. So those are the, like for every scene that I use to animate uh, for the sound, I use three basic nodes. First, something to like equalize uh, or pass filter to isolate the frequencies. Second is the envelope node to try and detect this up and down hills. And finally, the count node to really trigger at the kick or at the instrument you want to trigger. So those are like the basic nodes for, um, for animating with sound, like with raw audio. MIDI is a whole different story. 
we're going to see that later on, but uh, for raw audio, that's how you can use to uh, animate and, and sync to your music. And yeah, like I said, uh, Houdini can also be used uh, like as, uh, as a generative music software. So you can always, because you see here, it's just like a, a regular channel. Uh, I mean, it's audio, it's heavy, but in the end, it's just like a spline with some divisions. So you can generate that yourself. For example, but when a ball hits the ground, you can oscillate some waves at some frequency, and that can be used to uh, like emit like a, a collision sound or something. So, a lots of uh, lots of possibilities here. Uh, yeah. So I think with that, maybe I should uh, hand over to Guilherme again so that he can talk about constraints. And yeah, feel free to to carry on, oh, Guilherme. Don't worry, don't worry. We have time. Uh, I think uh, you can finish uh, everything you have uh, well separated for for today, and then I I'll take it to, to yeah the okay so stuff. yeah so to be honest I I think we we would be having like a very uh, like small presentation but I can show some some more stuff here or I can just go on and show MIDI right away. That's probably the best idea. So let me do that. Um, so what I'm going to do here is show you something that I did with MIDI files. So this is an example. So let me pause here for a second. So this one is for, um, well, I, I created a keyboard that can place the MIDI input. Um, the thing here is that I put together uh, like all these nodes into an HDA where you can see it's playing to the music. So it's a time lapse of the thing here. And just like before continuing, this one generates a note. So it generates a MIDI file and it sends the signal over to a uh, external player, right? So it's generating all the, like the procedural uh, well, it, this one is not procedural. I'm just reading a MIDI file. I'm using that MIDI file to generate simulations of little spheres touching the keys on the keyboard. This is, again, uh, sent through MIDI output signal to a player, which can play the sound of the music. So, So we need to add Mario, right? <laughs> uh, cool. So this is uh, like a, a, a very cool example on how you can import MIDI, do something with it. So this one is generating like this very simple rich body simulation. So the important thing to note here is that the signal that goes outside Houdini to the external player is not the, the one that came in. I'm actually do, doing the simulation, the ball hits the keys, and this is generating a new MIDI file. So it only syncs to the music because I'm generating the MIDI file after the simulation is done. So that's uh, an important thing here, right? So uh, I'm going to open uh, like a, a new file here to show you that in action, uh, which is, sorry guys, I should have this open already, but anyway, let me open here. Yes. Midi, midi, this one. 
So this one is uh, kind of a Gitter Hero thing, uh, but for it to work, I have to first open the external player. This one is free one. So what I want to do is to create a simple instrument here. So let me create a, like a piano thing. And I'm just like uh, informing that player to read from the MIDI channel I'm output, outputting the signal to. So it's this one, right? So now you can hear this place, but we are going to connect Houdini to this thing here. So we can go to the MIDI output and for it to work, I need to have the motion effects open it so it properly executes that. So let me open motion effects view. Uh, small trick, uh, this is going to be very slow if you display all the channels at once. So I just go and select any of them, just one. And it's going to be much faster and play almost in real time. Okay, so let's test that. So there you go. So this is running like real time. You can see it's very fast. It's just getting the input signal doing some stuff to like create this nice animation and sending that Fabrice, back to uh, There's a the question player. here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Marco is asking if uh, you can read uh, live, um, live uh, audio data, uh, like from a microphone. Yes, uh, from microphone, yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure there is a mic. Uh, a record thing here. I don't know if it is for microphone or just for. Yeah, uh, I thought uh, there was a microphone node or something. Uh, to be honest, I I'm I'm not really sure. I think you can. Uh, the microphone uh, node you probably know about is the one that is used for three D audio. So this is uh, like an object level thing. You can use a microphone here. But that one is to position the microphone where you want to sample the sound source from. So it's not like recording in real time. Um, I don't know this one. I don't know this one, Marco. Uh, I'll try and, and investigate and, and tell you later on. Sorry about that, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is. Oh, Fabrice. Yes. There is an audio in, audio in uh, node. Audio right. in. Yeah. Ah, yes, there is this one. Great, thank you. Yeah, audio in, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Microphone, there you go. Nice. Um, well, I should say uh, it can be, probably it can record real time uh, if you're dropping a record node, but uh, I'd like cache this before doing anything inside uh, Houdini. Because when you are working with audio data, like raw audio waveforms, uh, it becomes heavy very quickly. So, uh, well, wh what I usually do, also I, I forgot to say that on the previous example, but what I usually do to when I work with raw audio is whenever I, I import the file, I resample that down to maybe 10 kilohertz instead of the usual 44 uh, kilohertz. Because oftentimes, uh, like the audio quality is going to be much worse, uh, and you can like re hear that is like very very bad quality. But for animation, it's almost as good as the original file for detecting like the peaks and hills and valleys, for extracting um, instruments or extracting beats. So this one is like a little tip that can help you get like real time feedback. So. Uh, if you are Why not use 24 samples per second, since uh, usually we are animating in that sample rate? Uh, it's because for audio, you have a lot more information in the subframe uh, range. So for audio, I would say it's a little bit dangerous to, to, to use like the 24 samples per second. Uh, for example, on the visualizers thing I showed you, uh, this is querying like subframe data, right? So it's like a, a, a when you have stuff like you are getting like a time window of two seconds, for example, to display the waveform. 
uh, if you have like 24 samples per second, you have just like a, a curve with two points. <laughs> and uh, so for audio, I, I would go for much higher resolutions. Uh, and one thing to like pay attention to is that when you are like resampling your audio data, if you tr if you are trying to extract high pitch um, or high frequencies, uh, you have to you, you can go too far with the resampling because as you know, higher pitches demands more curve resolution to display. So it's really really tiny uh, waves. So if you resample down your audio too much, you are going to lose the higher pitches. So the higher pitches is the first thing you lose when you resample uh, audio. So, but uh, oftentimes you are just animating for the, the kicks or the beats or like the bass sound. So it, you are like free to, to go very, um, very aggressive with the resampling. Yeah. Um, Michelle is asking about the Andrew Oil two sets. Have you yeah, it's used it? Very, very nice. Uh, well, I, I still didn't have time to like properly uh, dive into it and check uh, like all the nodes and such. Uh, well, Andrew Law is a reference for like animating for music in Houdini. Like he's one of the first who like started doing all the experiments. Uh, and the, the two sets is like, sounds like a great two sets. Uh, for those who don't, who don't know, just look for HMT uh, on maybe on the Facebook group. He has posted some tutorials and has the link to the GitHub page where you can download and test. But uh, it's a great, uh, well, looks like a great uh, set of tools. I, I didn't have time to, to test those yet, but I should definitely do in the near future. Yeah. Um, sure. Can, can I ask you something? Uh, yeah, sure. It's the same subject. Hi, my but, name is Michel. I also work with Houdini for some time and I, I'm familiar with you guys, the work you are doing. I was just going to ask something about uh, the same subject. Uh, Andrew Lowell, I, I saw some of the, his videos about using music in Houdini. And he does something really interesting, which is he says that uh, he uses another software to like compose music and then he, he uses the, this data inside Houdini and inside of him, he does another stuff, another workflow. Are you familiar with that? Why? Uh, what? What is the benefit of that? Do you use it like this way? Yeah. So the benefit of that is that you can get the power of proceduralism you get inside Houdini. So I believe you are referring to he uh, like doing like the first work in a, in an ex external sequencer, and then exporting a MIDI file get that into Houdini and then with those notes, he like shuffles something like retime some of the stuff and then he exports again back to the uh, external player. So yeah, so this is a great uh, like type of workflow. You can like get really like the power of Houdini for proceduralism is like unparalleled. So it, you, you have like plenty of great nodes and he created that tool in such a way that he can like just have uh, he, he conceived it in the way that you have just simple uh, like uh, attributes that you can manipulate. So you can use like the beauty notes for like moving notes uh, ahead in time or, or back and forth. And yeah, this kind of uh, workflow gave him the possibility to, to use Houdini as a sequencer, to be honest. So he uses Houdini as like a sequencer for MIDI files and uh, I never did anything like that because, again, uh, I, I, I'm just like starting to push this far, um, and I also never had the need for it for any like commercial project. But uh, I'm also uh, very uh, interested in many workflows we can get from it. Um, one thing I'm very interested in, and that is, this is the difference between the work he's doing and the work that I'm doing. Uh, he is mainly working with MIDI files, um, so he's working with the like the, the notes themselves. I like to work with raw files, so the waveforms. Um, now raw files introduce a new set of complexities 
for example, let's say you want to create, so create generative audio in, in Houdini. Uh, there's one thing that is actually pretty close to 3D that's called audio, uh, audio modeling, uh, where you can generate uh, like a sound specifically of an instrument. So that is a very difficult, even for today's standards, mm. it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, but you can do in Houdini, you can uh, like try and generate some waves, some way that can resemble an instrument, right? So in Houdini, for example, you have the oscillator node. So the oscillator is a very simple node that can generate uh, sine, sine waves or many types of waves, really. So for example, let me do some live demo here of a very simple stuff. So I create a, a no node here. So that's going to be my play node. So for those who don't know, uh, you can play the output of a channel directly in Houdini without having to export it, which is great. And that's what I'm going to do here. So if you get to this chop node and get this play here. So everything I create inside here is going to send to my audio device. So for the oscillator, I can create a channel. So is there a very simple channel that is just inputting uh, like a constant value to this? So for the oscillator, uh, its base frequency is set to 440 Hertz, which is um, like the commonly used frequency for turning like pianos. So it's the middle octave uh, A note, uh, which vibrates at 440 Hertz. Um, so if we set the units per octave for, uh, to 12, so the 12 semitones, uh, we can vibrate. Uh, if we set that to zero, it's going to vibrate at the A note. So Let's play that here. It's going to be loud a little bit, so watch for your volume, guys. I'm sorry, I had to disable this one before. Not, not you. Sorry, let me put that into 440 hertz, and the audio value is one. Amplitude, but yes, we have also to up the sample rate here. So Guilherme here, you see uh, why I cannot like uh, use uh, 24 as the sample rate because my, uh, well, my channel here is vibrating uh, much faster than what the resolution can accommodate for. So I, I need to go, for example, to 10 kilohertz. And now we have a very, very high uh, sine wave, and now we can hear that. So let me turn down the volume. So this is uh, just a sine wave vibrating at 440 uh, hertz. So it's the A uh, notes we, you are hearing here. So if you want to hear uh, the A sharp, we can add one to this uh, value here. Now it's A sharp. This is a B, and you see you can, so you can generate sounds with uh, just simple waveforms. Uh, now, the thing here is that this is like a very boring sound. It's just a waveform, right? Um, to get from this to an instrument, that is the audio modeling part I'm talking about. That is like many, many ways uh, more complex than just having a, like a simple oscillator thing. And that's the thing I'm most interested in, interested in right now. Cool. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you for that yeah. explanation. Sure. Um, yeah, so... I saw that Andrew Lau, is, he uses mostly for... Uh, com uh, he composes music, right? He uses, I think, uh, outside Houdini. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the, the, the software that he uses, but he uses like an open source software to like compose the music, then they, he used that inside Houdini. And he explains that it's just a small part that he does outside, and then he brings that inside Houdini. Because Houdini, uh, even with all the resources, he still is not like, uh, like a full developed uh, music software. So mm -hmm. the things that he doesn't get with Houdini, he does with uh, that like uh, open source software, which he does. Uh, I think he can create something that, in a way that uh, I don't think uh, in a more practical way. So 
He uses that inside the I don't remember how, but I see that you can also like create a whole like notes and even like a, a keyboard with sounds inside Houdini. So you have the, capa uh, the all the capa capabilities, but mm -hmm. it seems that he chooses like the other software for some practical, I don't know, some practical tasks, but it's really cool to know about that. Thanks for the explanation. Man. Sure, yeah, you're welcome. And uh, well, uh, talking about this specifically, uh, he uses Houdini because Houdini has like everything you need for creating those type of stuff. Uh, the only difference that probably he goes from outside of Houdini is because, uh, well, Houdini is not designed for audio. Um, so audio, again, is very heavy. You have lots of samples. Uh, and when you play audio, you have to have uh, software that is specialized for it to get like re real time playback. So that's the reason why, or probably the reason why he just moves outside Houdini to do other types of stuff. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. as you can see, uh, you can do plenty of little uh, nice things with Houdini. Uh, you just have to somehow be able to cache your stuff from time to time because it can get quite heavy or maybe uh, you have to be aware of optimizations before, even before you start doing any like uh, manipulations to your audio data, so yeah. Cool. Fabricio, cool. Mark was asking a question. Uh, can you show us how Houdini reads the MIDI files? Because, yeah, sure. Uh, there are no waves, just notes. So yeah, how sure. does it work? Sure, it works like this. So I'm going to import, uh, there's one MIDI important here. So the MIDI uh, input, uh, it works like this. Uh, it creates a lot of channels. So you can see uh, you have, C, for example, the, uh, like this first one, uh, CH1 and zero. So this is basically telling that it's reading from channel number one on the MIDI file. So not confused with channels in chops. So channels in MIDI files is like the track you're reading from. So it's reading from channel number one and the note number zero. So this is like that specific note. And the value it creates, it's uh, like zero to one, depending on if the note is being played or not at that specific time. That's how it uh, reads MIDI files. So here, for example, let's try and look for some notes that have value one. So there you go. Here we are seeing uh, like all the notes. Let me just see like a single note and hope that this is played some Sometime in the timeline, probably we should start from 21 onwards. And let me see if I can find one. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. But anyway, so that's what it does. It's, it creates like, uh, it creates like this on off triggers. So the, the note is off when it's zero, the note is, one, uh, is on when it's one. And it creates this set of a uh, lot of channels. Now for MIDI files, there's a lot more than, than uh, notes themselves. You can uh, manipulate like the um, pitch wheels, for example, for those who like ever work it with MIDI controllers, you have pitch wheels, you have all sorts of knobs. But anyway, for, for MIDI, it, that's what it imports. And uh, the important thing uh, in MIDI is that uh, usually the MIDI uh, indices uh, they start at the number 21. So number 21 here, so channel something, the, so, so the channel went to read, and note 21 is going to be your very first note, note on the keyboard. So 21, 22 is the next one, 23, 24, and so on and so forth. So for, for this keyboard, what I've uh, constructed here, so it's an HDA, and what I have done in here, is let me change to 2D mode so it's easier to visualize. So this is uh, like a very simple geometry that has um, some attributes. So MIDI index is the uh, like the number of the note. So we can visualize that in here. So let me change the visualization for uh, markers and large font size. So there you go. So this is like the MIDI notes or the MIDI indices. So it starts at 21, 22, 23. And for playing the keys, what I do is to compare the current chop value for a channel. So let's say I want to check if note number 34 is played at the current time. I just go for the channel uh, 
CH1N34 in chops. And I can reach to, to that channel for, from Wrangles or from HScripts. Uh, from Wrangles, I use the chop function. Uh, so I can reach for that channel. So that's what you see in here. So first I build the channel name. So the channel name is CH and some channel and then N and some node index. So I'm concatenating to this uh, string the current channel I'm evaluating. In this case is channel one from that MIDI file and then MIDI index that is the attribute from that uh, specific key. Uh, so now if that is actually value on, on the current time, then I like uh, light that key with a red color. That's how I do here. So again, we can open the, the player here. I'm just going to create an instrument real quick and set that to play on the first channel of the MIDI file. I'm going to output from that chop net. And You see, uh, sometimes uh, it lags behind because uh, if you start interacting with the viewport, uh, like uh, the song stay in the buffer and then it's rushed through to, to uh, reach to your time, uh, time bar here. So, uh, and for this, uh, let me uncheck. So for these little notes here, what I'm doing in this file is to, let me go here to this core thing here. So what I do again is I input the keyboard, I have the notes, and I have a solver that adds points uh, whenever the key is hit. So, and sorry, let me uncheck that again. So every time, sorry guys, turn off the sound. It's not, not in play anymore. Yeah, so you can see every time one note is hit, it's creating a, a new point in here and it's also creating points on top of each other. But in another solver, I just move the, those points up. So as you can see here, so I'm moving that up and I'm also creating like uh, indices for each one of these uh, streaks so that it can create a line using the IDs for each particle later on, which I do here. Then in another uh, node, I'm creating the colors and creating the alpha uh, attribute so that it fades uh, and on the top part here. And finally, I'm sweeping to create a ribbon kind of, um, of uh, geometry here. So that's, that's really uh, simple, uh, but it's like a great visualization thing. And it was a very fun project to, to work. And so here, uh, like I'm using like the basics for a lot of stuff you can do with MIDI. So from here you can, for example, use, uh, instead of lighting up the keys, you can use to like explode particles or emit uh, like, I don't know, it's up to your creativity, emit smoke, emit uh, water splashes, you name it. So it's using that kind of uh, workflow really like opens up a lot of possibilities like uh, on the creative side. Uh, so yeah, I think that's actually all I had for today, Guilherme. <laughs> I don't think I have any more materials. Well, I can do some live stuff if you guys want to or have questions. Uh, I can try and come up with something like some freestyle thing here and we can try and do something or I can just hand over to you, Guilherme, again. Uh, well, uh, there, there are no more questions, but if someone uh, asks something, we can go back and yeah sure so okay. with that you got the mic again so um let's talk about uh constraints cool let me find file here so um why use constraints in a vfx environment it's easy to show i often see people importing alembics this way. This is, I, I will talk about the scene in a minute, but uh, I often see people importing alembics this way. And the problem uh, is 
you are transforming like a rigid, a rigid transformation into point deformation. In this case, uh, there isn't any deformation at all on the surface. It's just an object, an object track. So it's simple, it's just a simple transform. But if we do this way, we'll force every other node, every other uh, operator to cook every frame, every frame. So let, let me show you this. I have two, um, one minute. I have these two guys, they are the same. It's just uh, geometry and some uh, scatter on the surface. This is the, well, new approach to sourcing fluids, I think from 17. So if we turn on the, the performance monitor, it's easy to see the difference. Let me see here. The deforming one takes much more time because it is uh, evaluating every frame. And this one, since it is not deforming, it just uh, cooks once, so it's faster. And um, as I said, I often see new users doing stuff like this and uh, it sometimes takes more time to to cook this than the solver itself so it's not a well a smart approach i think of course there are there are other ways to solve this inside SOPs, like uh, freezing the transformation can uh, like uh, time shift and freeze this guy then uh, it will stop to cook the other nodes and with some clever nodes, like, um, let me see. There is this uh, transform, transform pieces and extract transform. So it can uh, like uh, solve this type of uh, problem inside SOPs. So we can get uh, the most of Houdini without uh, uh, spending uh, resources where it uh, doesn't need. But there's another question here. Let me see. Um, so why you use uh, constraints and shops at all? Because we could use uh, like something like this and we, we don't need to use chops, but chops has a lot of power. That's the point. So that's what I will show today. And first of all, this uh, I think it isn't the best uh, case scenario to showing the possibilities, but we'll do for today because I have a lot of MEDAs uh, on the project that I've worked on. So I can't show you the project, but this will, will do the, the trick. So what uh, is uh, CHOPS doing in this, in this project. I'll first show you what I did and then why. So here it is. Uh, this is the, the scene that comes from the track. As you can see, it uh, is in another position. It, uh, is, it, it has another scale. The scale is, uh, isn't a problem at all, but it has another scale. And uh, the problem that sometimes rises is tracking, especially object, tra object tracking. As you can see here, this is the path of the object. And um, let me see, yeah. And as you can see, there is a, pro a big problem here. In this case, I didn't solve, but, but often uh, we, when we, get, we receive uh, like a, a camera track with object tracking, 
sometimes the object uh, doesn't move exactly as uh, it was uh, shot on, on film. So sometimes it moves uh, a lot uh, more than the reality. Sometimes it moves uh, a lot less. And if we rely on the, the tracker guy to, show, to solve this problem, sometimes we don't have enough time to send it back and uh, wait to receive another tracking. And sometimes uh, he uh, can't solve it at all. So we need to find a way to, well, to do our scene in Houdini the best as we can with the tools and the, the assets that we receive. So that's one of the main things that I, uh, I use chops to, to, build, to build constraints. So as I said, I will show you what it is doing and then uh, I will uh, show how I did it. This, uh, this node, uh, he is, isn't using the uh, parenting in object level at all because he has this toggle turned on. So this is what I'm talking about. Is um, chops constraints uh, has a lot of a lot of, a lot of more power than object level constraints. First, of, first of all, here. If we needed to make a simulation that happens like uh, earlier than this frame, we don't have it because the shot starts on this frame. We don't have extra handles. We don't have uh, extra animation before the first frame. It's hard to build uh, this animation in object level, but in chops, it's easier. As you can see here, Here's the, the full animation of this object. And with uh, a little effort or no effort, no effort at all, we can like build uh, previous frames of animation. So here he's using the, the slope or the angle of the curves to build uh, more frames and if we go back like uh, on frame uh, minus five or minus 10 or 50, we have animation. So we can start our simulation before the first frame and still have movement. So it gives the, the correct uh, continuity of the, the simulation. This would be, I think, a little harder to do in SOPs or in object level, as I said. And it's the first reason to use uh, chops constraints instead of object level constraints. One note, when we turn on this guy, he replaces the parameters uh, values and the input uh, parenting with the constraints that comes uh, in this uh, path. So when this is on, there's no difference like uh, changing this or this. So as I said, the first reason is to um, um, create extra frames, but there are more. As I said, I, at least for me, it's easier uh, if I start the animation or at least the simulation near the, the ground plane, near this plane. So what I, I've done here was to get, this is the first frame of the, the, the animation. And then I inversed the, the transformation of the first frame. So I move everything, including the camera, everything together to the, well, to near the, the origin in the first frame. So it's easier to start everything since you know where, where it will start. And that's the, the, well, the first thing, that's the first thing. So I, as I said, I moved it to the origin, but it's not enough. 
because sometimes, as I said, we uh, don't have the exact movement of the object as it is on the, on the shot. And on the project I, I was doing, there was 17 shots, uh, something like this, like a fire. And I was afraid that the, the tracking wasn't good for us. So I needed to figure out a way to not use the track but still have a, a good uh, simulation. So uh, this is what the, this uh, network does. He compensates the, the movement of the object in the camera. So it's easier if I move for later frames. Here I, we have the full movement of the object and the camera. If I reduce this value, he's compensating the movement of the object on the camera. So as you can see, for the camera, the object doesn't move, at least relatively to the camera. But we are reducing, in this case, we are uh, zeroing out the movement of the object, not the rotation, ju just the tra translations. So in this way, we can uh, like uh, solve the whatever simulation we are doing would be like uh, placing a stock footage on a, well, on a composite network. And, uh, since uh, your stock footage is, uh, has the movement it was previously, previously shot, so if we reduce this value, since we, is, we are negating the movement of the object, we have to somehow fix it in the simulation to give it back. It's not perfect. I will see the difference here. see this one was the with the full movement of the object and this one is with the trick I think yeah the final uh, frames here it's not so good because you see that it's uh, moving with the object, not freely on the air. So as I said, it's more of the, the, a trick than uh, a physical solution, but uh, sometimes it's all that we, we got to, <laughs> to, to do our work. So... Guilherme, uh, sorry, I think we no. can't quite see that plane in real time. I don't know if we're seeing that in real time in our screen, but yeah, I'm seeing. Uh, I don't know if you are. You guys, can you guys see that plane in real time? Because I can't. Yeah, probably is doing so, to to zoom. Yeah, maybe it's it's difficult to spot like the difference uh, as you said. But anyway, just yeah. search into the room. Okay, um, so this one is the uh, with the full movement. I know it's it's hard to to spot because of the the frame rate of the the meeting, but this one is with the the trick. So as you can see, the curve is uh, behind him, and you can see the curve moving with the the object. So this one is with the trick. And of course, we can uh, find a middle ground just to solve the problems. Here, in this case, I didn't have enough time to, to try to solve this uh, rotation problem with the track, but, but probably I, uh, I could find a way to do it in chops too, because I could, uh, well, at least I could try to find a way to compensate it on the camera. 
So anyway, uh, Chops has a lot of tools for us to do that. And uh, one other thing, since we have the movement, I use the full movement to filter or um, make a blur in the, the movement and use that to create a vector pointing the direction of the movement. And then in the simulation, here I'm getting back that vector from chops so I can fake, uh, I can, uh, here I'm using the vector on the opposite way. So in, uh, I, I, here I try to use a force to cheat the movement since the object isn't moving uh, because we're compensated on the camera. I'm using a force to move the, the fire in this case as it was in a real uh, movement. So it's all about cheating. And uh, there's, there are another uh, reasons, like uh, here I'm creating a collision source and since we are transforming in object level, this guy doesn't have to be constantly uh, cooking on every frame. Again, as I said earlier, the only gotcha here is the one thing that you all uh, have to to keep in, to keep in mind is that um, when you we are here in the the DOP uh, network, I will show you here. Here I, I did some transformation in the geometry. Let me see here. Let me show you like in a simple way. Here. Here we have the the, the vectors, the, the velocities. Let me here set to value. I'm setting the velocity to one on the y-axis. It's strange here, but if I, yes, there's some, well, there's uh, some uh, menu that where I can reset the, oh, here. As you can see, we, we have the, the velocities on the y-axis. And if we look on the camera, the velocity is not on the y. It, it, it is following the movement of the object. Since the object is rotated, the velocity is rotated uh, with him. But when we generate the, the volumes, the values of the vectors are stored in the voxels. But when we load that here in the top network, as you can see, no, you can see now, here, as you can see, even though the object is rotated correctly, here we are in the, the dot network, the vectors are still pointing upwards. That's because even if you tell dots to use object transform like here, it doesn't change the values inside the voxels. So that's the main gotcha here, and you have to, to keep that in mind. Uh, it's not uh, complicated to, to fix that. Here with a simple Vopsop, 
actually this guy is the guy that uh, is doing all the work here just are uh, just uh, additions to that but here I'm getting the velocity and if I transform I'm transforming from space towards and the space is the transformation of the object it is just pointing to the to this object so this guy is turning the, the the directions of the vectors if we see here it's it uh, uh, looks strange but since here we are uh, converting to volumes and then translating and rotating when this gets to when it gets inside dots you see we have the correct uh, direction i know it's a little um like uh, math stuff it's a little complicated but we don't need uh, that many nodes to do that so as i said uh, using this kind of trick we can um use less uh less resources in the source step since we don't need to recook every time we have uh, more tricks upon our sleeves to change everything and fix some things that uh, perhaps uh, can or could have been or could have said uh, to us like not great and I think that's it. I, I know it's, as I said, it's a little complicated. Uh, Guilherme, I have a question. <laughs> yeah. If you will. Uh, first, uh, congratulations. Now every match move artist will be lazy because of you. Okay. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Now, uh, well, um, Talking about motion blur, um, when you like you do that kind of cheating to uh, like uh, get the, the movements from the camera instead of the object, do you happen to have any problems with motion blur or how do you handle no. like, like overall point velocities and do they look like weird on camera or if they do, how do you solve that? No, it's the same because the, um, the relative movement is the same. Mm. It's it's like, uh, but when you have uh, it, also uh, when you have the forming geometry, yeah, I get it. it. It's the same movement overall. We are just switching like which moves and where. But yeah. uh, even with like the forming geometry, is that like you get the exact same motion blur? I'm trying to to get well, my head around all that. Uh, uh, this works for rigid uh, uh, transforms. Okay. So the forming uh, geometry is another problem because mm -hmm. uh, you, ha you don't have uh, a uniform movement for the geometry. You have a difference. So probably uh, you have to, to find an intermediate step or way to, to cheat it. Probably uh, if you find the like, uh, average movement, Mm -hmm. You could still have the deformation, but the average movement you compensate on the camera. Yeah. So that would be uh, well, like a, a possible solution to that. Very cool. I uh, I think uh, this kind of constraints lacks uh, some master classes. I think there is only one master master class on chops constraints, and it doesn't uh, give us much. Uh, I still, um, well, it's, it's still strange to me, the constraints uh, here in CHOPS. Uh, as you can see, I'm using a lot of these uh, multiply nodes. And even uh, I'm a mathematician, these ones look strange to me because it operates on the inverse uh, uh, order that it's natural to me. Uh, I could have... Uh, been using like the parent but uh, I, I don't know how to use it properly sometimes it, it works ex as expected sometimes it doesn't so it's still like a mystery there are a lot of mysteries here and what I uh, wanted to show is that 
it has a lot of um, well, possibilities. We can use chops for a lot of different things, as uh, we've seen today uh, with the what Fabricio showed us here. It's like a different kind of um, use of chops. Is a little, as I said, uh, technical because it's math, but uh, if you like um, see each node here, it's not uh, so, so complicated because here we have uh, like blend constraints and here uh, would be the same as using parenting. Yeah, yeah, uh, Marco is uh, uh, saying here that uh, usually the client doesn't uh, know the well how much time do you do we spend to create solutions like this but i spend a lot of time in creating the solution because because i didn't want to spend more time uh, arguing with the client that the tracking wasn't good enough that was their problem not mine so sometimes uh, we have to to figure out a way to, to do our work, even uh, receiving less than optimal assets. So I, I think it, it, this area needs a lot of uh, knowledge. It needs uh, time to dig and find how it properly works. It's not uh, so straightforward, but as I said, what I'm uh, trying to show here uh, are the possibilities. I'm using more and more constraints in, in chops to do that kind of trick. Uh, probably I, I will save this somehow as, as, a, as a, um, a more broad asset. This one was uh, created just for this kind of need. Of course, uh, if we had like uh, other 3D objects on the scene, this uh, wouldn't work, but it's, as I said, uh, each shot is a different problem. If we, we solve one, we can uh, go to the other. So uh, I think, uh, well, that's uh, all that I've prepared for today. Uh, I think it, at least, it, as I said, uh, some of the things uh, were a little bit clear, but if you want to, to ask you more question, just shoot us. Fabricio? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm still trying to get my head around how you showed this today. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, fast, I know. We do have a lot of complicated stuff in there, but it's, all, it's a great, it's a great solution for like common, like daily, uh, like issues we had uh when doing this kind of work and uh, it's also great that you can generalize the formula into an iga and save that for later use on other projects um very very cool solution uh, yeah, the, the, the idea is simple is uh here uh it's like blend nodes blend the the x forms it's uh for the first time when you see this you you, you say oh, well it's very very complicated but it's not that much it's mm -hmm. just one step after the, after the other, so it takes a time, a little bit of time, but... Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. If you, I were to like inspect your scene for like at least half a day, <laughs> I'd get how, how everything is, is wired together, but it looks like a very, very uh, elegant solution. Um, very nice. So I think that's it. Uh, yeah, well, I, I don't have any more stuff to show. Uh, if you guys don't have any more questions, maybe, um, I don't know how we are on, on time. Well, I think we can wrap it up for today. All right, so. And if, uh, um, well, people want to know more about this, we can perhaps on another meetup, uh, prepare more stuff. I've been uh, very busy, so this was the the one thing that I I uh, have time to prepare. 
But uh, as I said, if you want more, just make more. Yeah. So from me, thank you guys very much for, again, joining us today. Um, the music part uh, was all I had today. But uh, if you guys are interested in this kind of stuff, I have like a lot of materials in there, uh, all my like test uh, folders and, su and such. Uh, I'm planning to do a series of tutorials um, because today was only to show like the possibilities here. But if you are interested in, uh, well, I had those for a while now. I just didn't like put uh, stuff on the internet, like doing video tutorials and, and such because uh, to be honest, people don't seem to be like interested in into that kind of uh, chops subject, uh, I should say. But if you do, please, let uh, let me know, let the community know, and uh, I'll try and put together some like really in-depth tutorials about these uh, on the next days. And I can share like the scenes with you and whatever, just uh, hit me with emails or something and we can uh, keep discussing. So yeah, for me, thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you on the next one. And yeah, have you all great uh, evening. Yeah, I can't uh, share the the footage because it's from uh, FX PhD, but I can uh, share the the file. Perhaps I I could uh, do a, a little a bit of polish. But if you want, as uh, Fabricio said, just uh, well ask and we'll do uh, what we'll do the best we can. Okay. So until the next time, bye guys. Bye Have everyone. Nice week.